Okay, let's look at John 7, 25 through 54. As we... 44. Yeah. I didn't tell you 54? <laughs> Oral tradition trumps written revelation. So, if you've got that, get it out. I have Ben's and both of you emailed me, so thank you. I uh, appreciate your work. I also got an email from Calvin with his work as well. So, we're good to go, and I appreciate your hard work. And before we look at the text itself, you were assigned the reading of the syntax summaries from Wallace. So, this is a little bit of a general question, but any questions from that in the sense of Maybe Wallace talked about something that just you just made no sense to you or that was so foreign you wanted it explained or I'm sure there was new material there that you hadn't seen in the sense that when we did syntax last term, we did it with black and Wallace is much more extensive. Though I find that to be more helpful. It's more options and hence more details. It's easier for you to highlight a particular usage. So just any of his usages, though, that you thought, I would like something said about this before we continue? The feeling is more like uh, I'd like to spend time and read this book. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, and ideally that would be what we would have done last term. So next, next time the class comes around, the goal is to get it in. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. But got the summaries there, so you can kind of get the gist of it, and they settled. Yeah. 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 That will help, at least having it there. And as we talk through them all, you'll get the relevant ones explained. So, Ben? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Okay. All right. Good. Good. I have a standing confusion with attendant circumstance participles. Okay. But I don't feel it's so, it's not like a, I understand nothing until it's explained. But right. Sometimes I don't really understand why that one is or isn't. The explanations I've read about why it isn't in this case mm -hmm. doesn't, I don't get it. Okay. So that's one. Okay. Maybe we'll address that then toward the end of second hour will take enough time to say something about that. So just remind me. Don't let me forget. About 12.45. Now let me chance to pull up my notes and highlight the, the relevant material. So, Okay, good. So attendant circumstance. We'll remember that. Say something about that. There are none in this tag, so you're safe so far. All right, anything else? Uh, I don't think I even... Do I grade you on that reading? No, I don't even grade you on it. So, no need to even tell me if you did it. I don't. Th I didn't think I did. So, all right. Uh, second, before we get going, I mean, Roger had a question about how can you speed up the process of parsing, analysis, and translation so as to make this a little quicker. I imagine Roger's concern is shared by all of you that the work of translation analysis takes an inordinate amount of time, at least a lot of time, and you love to do anything you can to save time. So anything more specific than that, Roger? Maybe a, is it the parsing, or is it the analysis, or is it the translation, or is it the entering of the data in a way where I can read it, or all of the above? Right, right. Just do the, the words that you want. Right. There would, would be still okay. Right, right. Are you having trouble figuring out which words I want? 
in the sense when I say all nouns, infinitives, and participles, you, 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 do you feel like you have to work through every word to figure out which one is a noun, infinitive, participle? Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. Mhm. 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 Right. Others. Anybody want to add anything to that? Or so Roger's chief concern is data entry. Um, others. Is it the parsing? Is it the translation? Is it the making a decision about what which of these twenty-two genitive usages is it is? Mm -hmm. Of course, but I would like to spend more time doing that right. than doing right. words that are not as relevant. Have you, I mean, I've, I've told, now just correct me if I'm misunderstanding what you're saying. I've told you not to parse or analyze or note the ones that aren't nouns, okay. participles, and infinitives. Right. Yeah, I mean, forgive me if I've not made this clear, but when I want you to translate, that's an English sentence you're giving me. When I want you to analyze, I only want you to parse and analyze nouns, infinitives, and participles. That means I don't need to see da, ek, object to the preposition, etc., on your analysis. You only have to note the relevant words. Good. Ben? And, I, and sometimes I find, I've just started typing, sometimes I find writing is quicker. But I've started to type too, so there's ways to do both quickly. But sometimes if writing is the quickest. Ben? Um, for your email, um, you sent me a poem. Yeah. Um, I think it's called Mind Translation. That is correct. Yes. Only note, parse, and analyze what I ask for. Nouns, participles, and infinitives. But, that is a but if it's the object of the preposition, you don't have to note it. Uh, I don't have to so it becomes why? the exception. Exactly. That's exactly right. I, can just I will show you guys my notes. No, no. Pronouns, yes. Pronouns, yeah. Sorry, did you say pronouns? That was the second one. Yes. Yeah. So pronoun, demonstrator, pronoun. Yeah, that, that, those are all nouns. Okay. Okay. Nouns including pronouns, all kinds, personal, okay. demonstrative, relative. When I'll bring it back. There will, there will come some assignments where I will probably have you do articles, but as of now, you, even if it's functioning like a noun, it's okay. So here's mine. All right, so there's verse 25. Now, I put un in there because I'm going to make a comment on it, you know, as the teacher. But then notice, 10s, you wouldn't have uk. Again, I'm just going to make a comment on that. So yours would have 10s, hutas, on, and that is an infinitive, so it would have that too. So verse 25, you'd only be telling me four words, parsing um, and analysts. In this case, um, you, you wrote the direct object of upper. Uh, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep. Do I need to write all of them? I mean, direct object of something or I'm something. going to ask you in class. If you put it on your sheet, direct object, that's fine, but you notice every time you tell me that, I say of what? Subject of what? So, and notice how I, I've just written it in English letters. That's to save time. I'm not going to go paste in the text in every time I need Greek. Yeah. I know what the word is, and you'll figure out a system too. Okay. If you're handwriting it, it's just as quick. Send us just one example after. Yeah, yeah, I don't mind. 
doing that at all. In fact, what I do is then this that's a Logos note. Uh, Logos gives you the option to export your notes into a Word document. So there it is. And I will give that to you at the end of Thursday's class once we're all done. And that will give you an example of what I'm looking for. And even in there, there will be some things you don't have to tell me. There are words I'm putting in there because I want to ask you about them. I want to see if you caught the significance. But all you have to do is note, parse, analyze nouns, including pronouns, infinitives, and participles. You've got to translate every word, but you don't have to note it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, when a participle is a substantive, all that really means is the participle is acting like a noun. So tell me, how is the noun functioning? Depending on the case, what's the use? Participles can be in any of the cases. I don't know of any vocative ones. Maybe they're out there. But participles can be nominative, genitive, dative, accusative. So if you're telling me, well, that's a substantive participle, what you're saying is it's a participle functioning like a noun. So now, if it was a noun, you would be telling me what the case usage is. Nominative, accusative, dative. Right, and then of what? Now, if it's nominative, is it subject? Is it predicate nominative? Yeah, yeah. If it's a genitive... What kind? Descriptive, objective, subjective, same with dative, same with accusative. So, good? Is that a hand? No, no, it is a hand. It is a hand, <laughs> but not, <laughs> not a raised hand. Good point. <laughs> All right, good. Um, I should maybe apologize for sending out tables that gave the impression. Because that's actually, like, when I did pre thesis online, I did every single word. I think I used to require that. Yeah, Yeah, I, I began to look at my notes, and I'm like, I have no files for Calvin. I have two other online students, but not Calvin. I'm like, why is that? And I forgot there was a term where he took it for me. Yeah. Might have been two terms. So, so anyways, I'm sorry for making you go through what I went through. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I think at one point I had everybody do them all. That was the only class I was doing, so I actually learned most of my Greek that fall anyway, so yeah. it was good for me. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I go back and forth. Sometimes I handwrite, sometimes I type. And with Wallace, I mean, it, it bugs me that we have not gone through Wallace. I wish we could. Just the only solution would be to have you, in addition to everything you're doing in this class, also read Wallace, which would be another 700 pages of reading, which you probably don't want. The syllabus had it originally, and then I ditched it. Because just to have you read it, our explanation time is limited. So, I mean, it's just it's just a... One of those unfortunate things. So, yeah, there you go. You guys want that? A Wallace seminar, Christmas with Wallace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A Wallace Christmas. A Wallace Christmas. So, in intermediate classes to come, they will, they'll get it. I mean, I'll just find a way to make mounts fit the ten weeks, and then they'll get ten weeks of Wallace. But, I mean, I just recommend that you take time at some point to read through it. Um, I didn't read through it prior to exegesis, I don't think, or at least, yeah, I think it was after exegesis I finally read through it, so you're not permanently handicapped by not having it. It's one of those things that you'll use as a reference work, and it will become more familiar. So, All right, good. Any other questions then before we jump into John 7, 25? All right, very good. John, I will have you lead us out, please. Read verse 25, and then I will ask you to parse and analyze the words. Very good. Nice and smooth. So the word 10s, how would you parse it, and what usage would you give it?
the definite pronoun is the subject, uh, is nominative, uh, plural, uh, masculine. Correct. And just to speed up, if, if when I say parse, you can simply give me gender, number, case, and function. If it's a, uh, if it's a noun, you don't even have to tell me that it's a uh, relative or indefinite pronoun. Though that's, you're correct and that's helpful. Um, but even if you just want to tell me those main things, that would be correct. So it is the subject of elegon. Notice that 10s there in the nominative case is the subject of elegon. It's those who were saying. Ben? Um, oh, what's the order when I say? Oh, gender, number, case, use. If, if you mix it, that's fine. Okay. No big deal. Uh, very good. John, what about hutas? Demonstrative pronoun. Uh, it's, it's, uh, indefinite. Not indefinite. Demonstrative. Uh, so, yep, this function, usage. Is, uh, Correct. Of. of um, Very good. Very good. This is. And if there had been another rival word for the subject, this most likely would trump it because demonstrative pronouns take priority when being in what we call equative clauses, clauses where you have a linking verb, a, a, is, b type sentence. This is the one. So the demonstrative gets priority over everything else. After that, it's articles or articular nouns and proper names tied. All right, good. And how about Han there, that relative pronoun? Good, and it's function. That's its part of speech, but what, how is it functioning? What's its, you said it was accusative. What kind of accusative? You need to put them up for you real quick. All right. There's your uses of the accusative. Which of those do you think best describes the relative pronoun Han. So that's a little small. Do you have a direct object? Double accusative? Cognate accusative? Predicate accusative? 
Accusative subject of infinitive, accusative of retained object, pendant, apposition, adverbial, basically manner, space or time, general reference, and oaths. That is correct. Very good. Very good. This is the one whom they seek to kill. And keep in mind that relative pronouns, the case, is determined by their function in the relative clause. It's referring to Christ. And so in the previous phrase, it would be like a predicate nominative. This is the one. But in the relative clause, this is the one whom they seek to kill. Thus, it's the direct object in the relative clause, and hence it is accusative. Calvin? Oh, sorry. Tripping me out with that hand. All right, very good. All right, lastly, John, apoctani. Please parse that and give me its usage. Yep. Good. Okay. They are seeking him in order to kill him. I would, I'll take purpose. I'll take purpose. I think that might be saying a little more than is really intended. And I'd look for something even a little more general. Anybody else have something different? Complimentary. All right, complimentary. That's what I had originally because it appears to complete the thought they're seeking to kill. But I even changed it from that to anybody got anything else? What are they? S <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. It's uh, like a result. Nope. Kind of thing? Okay, no. They're seeking him, but the result that they'll kill him. I would go with purpose before that. I just think direct object. What are they seeking to kill? Purpose works too. So? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I do. Tells you what they're seeking. If it is direct object, I mean, do you, do you mean the usage is direct object? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How how is that different from complementary? Complementary is the idea of the verb. The finite verb is incomplete. In other words, it can't express a complete thought without the infinitive. Now, granted, that's true of any sentence, but they are seeking is in and of itself a, a full thought versus they are able or they are not able or they are about to. Okay. I see complementary being completing the thought of the together they make one idea. Here, the, the question is asked, they're seeking what? Oh, I would say complementary is that it, Wallace uses the phrase supplementary. It's used with helper verbs to complete their thought. Such verbs rarely occur without the infinitive. Okay. So, in other words, it's not, it's not the kind of thing you just stick on. Yeah. Helper. He says this structural clue. The key to the complementary infinitive is the helper verb. The most common verbs that take a complementary infinitive are archomai, bulamai, dunamai, Epitrepo, zeteo, ooh, zeteo, zetelo, mello, and aphilo. So it's either complementary or direct object, but I take purpose too. There's obviously a certain ambiguity here and even fuller meaning in, in that very limited sense. Obviously, they want to find him so they can kill him. But perhaps complementary is best to make the complete thought or direct object. Direct object, one weakness of that, I'll admit this, would be you think of a direct object of having a substantive idea. In other words, the infinitive emphasizes the noun side of it, and that wouldn't really work here. So maybe complementary is better. Would, what would happen to Han, then, if it was direct object? Well, I think that could still be the direct object of the infinitive, since the infinitive is a verbal noun. Isn't No, because it's not performing the action. Like I know it doesn't him isn't not here. him's not trying to kill. Okay, so there there can be an accusative and a yes. related and direct object, but 
you you can have infinitives that have two accusatives governing them. One is the subject, one is the object. And then you have to figure out which was which. Okay, yeah, very good. Yeah, all right, I'll go. You know, I'll I'll pull back. Let's go with complementary, especially in light of Wallace putting Zeteo in there. And then the Han does make it a little rough. So complementary, but I'll take purpose. Good. That's good. Uh, any questions on that? All right. Two questions for anybody. Un. John translated it therefore, and that's perfectly legitimate. That's where I started with my own translation, but I changed it. What, what other nuance do you think un could be communicating here? Then? And do you base that on anything particular that you read? John. Okay. John, good. John uses a lot. Yep. I got it from uh, how you guys read in the scripture index of Wallace. Every time you're f he highlights these verses here, verses 25, 28, 33, 35, and 40 as the transitional use of un, translated as then. So if you check that reference, which I know you all did, because you're supposed to, then you would have you, you noticed that. But maybe you could have kept therefore, you could have gone with then. Either is fine. Good. And then uk, the negative particle there. Does that expect a positive or a negative answer? If there's, an if there's an implied question, which keep in mind all the punctuation is supplied by editors. Go ahead. Yes, you, by that you mean it expects a positive answer? Yes. Yeah, that's correct. That's correct. Uh, it expects a positive answer. Uh, is this not the one they are seeking to kill or... This is the one they are seeking to kill, isn't it? You could render it like that. And the majority of text doesn't include a question mark, but other additions do. Uh, Nestle Alon there has the semicolon, which in Greek is a question mark. So th that is going to come up two more times, I believe. Um, implied questions here in some of these statements. And the use of the negative gives you a clue. So good. Very smooth. The alternative May. Would expect a negative answer. And that's coming in one of the later verses. All right, good. Verse 26. Roger. All right, very good. And you put, and behold, that he speaks publicly. Any reason you added that? In other words, there's no word in the Greek text for that. So, you, but you added it. Anything? Are you trying to bring something out? Mm -hmm. this, this is what we want you to see, content of the Ida. Yeah. yeah. Ida is more of a, you know, it's not, content kind of flattens out the point. Notice the exclamation mark. It's, and look, he's speaking publicly. So it's not just, here's what I want you to see. It's, it's an interjection, a, a heads up. It's like hene in Hebrew, which you'll get to. Yeah, yeah. So behold, he's speaking publicly. Okay, that was that was your marginal reading. Very good. Some ancient, some ancient manuscripts read. Some versions read. The Roger ver. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's that's good, Roger. <laughs> that's good. You guys are on the fast track. So, Roger pars paresia for me. Good. Used how? 
Excellent. How did you translate it again? Oh, good. So you translated it adverbally. Very good. Wallace highlights this one uh, in his discussion of data of a manner. So, good. That's what I like to hear. So, yeah. Uh, manner, it's how he's speaking. He's speaking not just with openness, but openly, publicly. Very good. Uden. Of? Sorry? Uden. Uden, correct. Yep, that's where I'm hunting at. He told me direct object. Direct object of what? Uden. Correct. And how'd you parse it? Good, good. And the neuter form is the same in the nominative and accusative, in the singular. So how do you know it's not nominative and not the subject? Sorry, all right, good question. <laughs> of course it is, that's why I asked it. Sorry, I'm stealing all Chuck's jokes. That is correct. If it's okay. translated as the subject, you get, and nothing is saying to him. That just doesn't make any sense. So, plus, what number is the verb legacy? Singular. That's right. Or no, I mean plural. 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 You messed me up there. So, they are saying. So, Uden cannot be the subject of legacy because it's singular and so. Well, let's hear it. I said, but no one makes a reply to him. Nope. I liked that. Nope. But I know it's not what it actually says. Nope. So they are not saying anything to him. Um. Uden being singular. It also being neuter means it has more the idea of thing than person. Plural verb. It's got to be the direct object. That is correct. So legacy is they said to him. That's right. That's right. They are seeking to kill him. Or is not this the one they're seeking to kill? He's speaking openly, but they're not saying anything to him. And I think in the net Bible notes, one of the uh, explanatory notes made the point, that maybe, you know, the crowd is seeing their silence as perhaps improve, approval of his claims. I mean, if they're trying to kill him, but now they're not saying anything, maybe they believe that he's the Christ. Which I think is... Did they say this ironically? I mean, this isn't a Greek question, I think the people are somewhat befuddled because they observe that th they, they say in verse 25, this is the one they want to kill, right? We come to verse 26. Well, he's speaking openly and they're not saying anything to him. So now we have the may pate. May would expect what kind of answer, positive or negative? So now they're saying it's not possible that the rulers know that this one is truly the Christ, is it? So there's the confusion. Okay. There's the confusion. I think so, yeah. I didn't expect that to be answered by grammar, more just 
Yep, that's the back and forth of the ook and the may. And why, again, some editions see this as a question, not a statement. Does it, is it significant whether we translate Christos as Christ or Messiah? Well, I mean, that would really just depend on the audience. Uh, you know, what, what, what do the words communicate to the audience? So, I mean, obviously, as again, the Net Bible note brings out, Christos, anointed one, refers to Messiah, Mashiach, Hebrew verb, or in the nominalized form of the verb, to anoint. So it's their equivalent. It's the same meaning. So Messiah helps bring out the continuity with the Old Testament idea, and thus is a very good translation. Christ is obviously the transliteration of the Greek and therefore a very traditional and well-known translation. But if you want to bring out maybe the biblical theology aspect, you could do Messiah. Yeah, you would have, yeah, I think you would want to avoid the idea that Christ is his name, since that is his title, correct? Good, other questions? Uh, Roger Altu, no, Alto, excuse me. Good, from Vagusi. Hoy Archontes. Nominative plural, masculine, subject. Correct, of... Correct. Who toss? Nominative singular, masculine. Function. Subject. Of. Good. And what is the predicate nominative? Assuming there is one. Good. Very good. Questions on the verse? Ben? Um, mm hmm? Accusative. Yeah, it's from Udes, Udemia, Uden, basically meaning no one or no thing. And then in the neuter side of it, both the singular nominative and the singular accusative have the same form. Frequent and neuter for nominative and accusative have the same form. So we, we assess it as accusative because being singular, it couldn't be the subject of the plural verb. Now, in reverse, sometimes neuter plurals take singular verbs. Because they're viewed collectively. All right. Neuter plural will sometimes take singular verb. But I don't think you're going to have neuter singular taking plural verb. So, behold, he is speaking publicly and they are not saying anything to him. Is it possible that the rulers know that this one is truly the Christ? Verse 26. Good. Any questions on verse 26? All right, Calvin, you want to do 27? Sure. But we know where this man is from, and when the Messiah comes, no one will know where he is from. Good job. Teuton. That's right. We know this one, or we know this man, and we know what, where he is from. Uh, ha Christos, you got an easy verse. Subject. 
Okay. Right, give me, bear with me one second. I'm going to have your analysis up. Okay, good. Yep, the Christ when he comes. And then Udais. That's a masculine non out of singular subject. Uh, that's right. So now here's the masculine Udais. And here it is as the subject. This one is nominative. And I'd, uh, the accusative form wouldn't be the same. Yeah, or udon te, or udon ta, if it if it forms according to one of the third declension. Well, the third declension pattern. I'm thinking. Is it? You can go grab it if you want to. Let's see if I can. Because you might be right. The, uh, there are somewhere masculine also mirrors. Third declension has multiple patterns, so it may not even be in here. Let's see if you can find it first. Two thirty four. It's not on two thirty four. Oh, that's how many times it occurs. It's in chapter 10. Almost there. Chapter 10. Which I think is the first one with third declensions. Yes, it is. Second half of this word declines just like haste. No, I, just, I can't remember. Anyway. All right. Good. Good, good, good. So, subject. So, we know where this man is from. So, in contrast. No, not, not in contrast. Not in contrast yet. That's in the next verse. So they're trying to figure out whether or not he is Messiah, and they bring out this statement, we know where this man is from. Okay, let's hold on, look at this real quick at the beginning of verse 27. Uh, we know this one. Why do you think, now you told me this direct object of oida men. How did you relate Pothen Esten to Allah Tutan? Oidemem. Read me that, your first part of the verse again. But we know where this man is from. All right. We know where this man is from. Now, that's frequent, that's frequent in translation, and that idea works. And there's, there may even be a grammatical rule that justifies it. But based on what I'm looking at, when I hear you say that, we know where this one is from. This one becomes the subject of estim. But what case is Teuton? Okay, all right. Teuton is a accusative singular object of oidemen. That is correct. We know this man from where he is. Yeah, that works. We know this man, i.e. where he is, and then you would just supply from. Yeah. Hot then is just a particle, right? It's not like a... Yep. Or it's like an, ad, it's like an adverb modifying Eston, I would think. Yeah. No, 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 you wouldn't do that. Yeah, it's indeclinable. Yeah, yeah, you're correct on that. So, yeah, so notice that we know where this man is from works. And, again, that, that's frequent in... Uh, yeah, it's kind of the closest to the, to the formal structure there. Yeah, it's just an interrog interrogative adverb. 
Pothin. So I might go with that. We know this man. Well, what do we know about him? We know where he is from. That's correct. You can do that in English, but it's not exactly what the Greek is saying. But it is the same idea. That's what they're saying. We know where he's from. That's the main idea. That works. How, how is Pothin actually related to Teuton? Is it kind of a pivot thing where Teuton sort of becomes the informal subject of Eston again? I mean, I would just think it's giving you the content of what they know. We know this one, but what do you mean? Where he is from. Yeah, yeah. Maybe even, what are those? Quotation marks. Or I.E. I.E. We know this one, that is, where he is from. Which is a problem for their messianic theology because so they say when Christ comes, no one will know. And then notice there, Again, Pothin Esten. No one will know where he is from. So notice Udais there is connected to Gnoske, and then you have the same adverbial phrase. No one will know what, where he is from. Which in the Net Bible Notes observed, not sure where that tradition came from, because it's, it's not based solidly on the Old Testament. The Old Testament states will be born in uh, Bethlehem, and that, you know, the, the wise men were able to discern that. You do have statements and other prophets about the Messiah appearing, so maybe they were interpreted to mean he appears out of nowhere. But the idea is there's, there's nothing to justify this as a correct assessment of, of Messianic theology, and that the views of intertestamental Judaism weren't monolithic and they weren't always correct. Does Gnosuke maybe have more than like a cognitive meaning there? Could it be more like he's one of us, he's from the same kind of place that we're from, we know the sorts of places he came from, uh, he's too normal <laughs> in a way? Like I'm sure Yeah, that would. I don't know if I based on Gnosko. Okay, not Gnosko. Yeah, exactly. You have epigonosco used sometimes with moral connotations, you know, ethical knowledge. You ought to know God. I think that's what's in Romans 10.4. They are 10.2. They have zeal for God, but not according to knowledge, epigonosco. I, I translate that as they are zealous for God, but they don't know God. So... So yeah, B's here is like, well, we know where he's from, so he can't be Messiah, right? Then Jesus will say something in verse 28 to counteract that. Any questions on verse 27? Oh, I demand, yeah. Correct. Correct. So how can I translate it? Like yeah, yep, we know. Yep, we know. It's in uh, Mounts here. It says the same thing. Let me find it real quick. Oida, a strange verb. Oida actually is a second perfect form functioning as a present. By the way, when he puts uh, the perfect form for, you know, those little columns there. Uh, a dine, what's in the perfect column, is actually a, no, 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 what's in the aorist column, sorry, is actually a pluperfect functioning as an aorist. So perfect in form, functioning like present, pluperfect in form, functioning like aorist. It's like everything's shifted to the left. He goes, just memorize the forms. If you want an explanation, see Morphology of Biblical Greek. Yeah, yeah, it is. Good thing English doesn't do this, right? You also want to be careful that you don't get oida mixed up with the aorist form of horao, which is what? Oh, yeah? To see, idon. Yep. Yeah, something not right here. You have Idon there in verse 26. Behold, 
Ida. Drop the epsilon because it's present imperative. All right? Or heiress imperative, sorry. All right, very good. Actually, let me look at one more thing. Calvin, since you got an easy verse, I'm going to give you verse 28 too to satisfy um, Roger's sense of justice. All right. Okay. All right, go ahead. Roger's sense of justice is a little overboard for my <laughs> he, was, he was giving me the evil eye. 28. Oh, it, oh, yeah, you Canadian guys. Yes. No, 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 no. Remember? Always I give the longest. That is true. <laughs> Providence has um, not been kind. Okay, I just want to make sure I know that. <laughs> okay, I've got it. Then while he taught in the temple, Jesus cried out, saying, You know me, and you know where I am from. I am not from myself, but the one who sent me is true, the one whom you do not know. Right, very good. Parse for me, good translation, and we'll, there's a few areas I'll say something about, but let's parse first, then we'll come back to the sense of the passage. Didaskon, or didaskon. That's a masculine nominative singular present active purposeful. Use. Temporal. Temporal, very good. So, Jesus cried out while teaching in the temple. And notice that didaskon, it's nominative, it lacks the article. The subject is the same as the main verb. The one who cries out is the one who is also teaching. So all the ideas that need to be in place for an adverbial participle is there. So then when you start looking at your different nuances, really time just works the best. Jesus cried out by means of teaching. That's how he cried out or he cried... He used teaching to cry out, is the idea of means. Kind of like I hit you with a hammer, which I won't do. But he cried out by means of teaching. <coughs> you'd, be, you'd be better off with manner. How did he cry out in a teaching manner? That, that at least links the two ideas but that's where it gets awkward because crying out and teaching aren't referring to the same thing. But rather, while he is teaching, he cries out and says what we read in the next phrase. So crying out and teaching are not the same. Correct. That is correct. Yes, yet. We're not into, uh, <laughs> we're still in John. Two things. I would shy away from saying punctilier in association with heiress because that's not always true. Oh, I only meant in this case. Oh, in this case. Good. All right. Very good. Secondly, I was thinking that because of the relative nuance of one is heiress and the other is imperfect. But if heiress and imperfects are both secondary tenses, then they might be contemporaneous here. That's not always in play with a participle because obviously participles don't have any kind of temporal reference other than in relation to their main verb. But since you've got imperfect verb and then aorist participle, I think they're probably bidding get imperfect? Yeah, ek kradzen. I never said anything. There you go. <laughs> so they're on the same kind of plane. While this is going on, okay. while teaching, he cries out. So, good. All right, so does that make sense then? Are there any more questions on that? All right, good. He cried out, sang. How would you parse and analyze legon? Okay. Okay. Right. Very good. And 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 we will get to attendant circumstance at the very end. Uh, one thing about attendant circumstances, sometimes, well, okay, what I'm about to say would actually work here, so I won't, I won't say it because it doesn't make, doesn't make my point. If you notice, what Legon does here is it introduces direct discourse, 
what follows legon is what he says and you've already had a verb of saying so legon becomes somewhat redundant and thus it's the redundant or pleonastic participle where it basically just repeats something you've already been told we already know he's talking he cried out sang so saying there functions redundantly and really then just introduces the direct discourse you can even sometimes leave it out in translation he cried out while teaching comma quotation yeah exactly That's exactly right which i think we have one of those in this in this chapter so there you go Plea any questions from anybody on that one All right, good. He cried out while teaching, sang, and then the emphasis is on what follows. So in fact, even when your uh, speech teacher taught me this, if you're reading this publicly, don't put emphasis on the word sang, downplay that, and then when you start to give the direct discourse, accent. Same with like the word behold, it, it often introduces. All right. Okay, very good. So Jesus, and that's the subject, we won't, we won't belabor that. So Jesus while teaching, or excuse me, uh, while proclaiming in the temple. Jesus cried out while proclaiming in the temple, saying, Kame. How do you parse that? That's um, a connection of Kai and Mm-hmm. Good. That's right. You know me. Uh, any nuance to add to it from that you notice in the lexicons or anything? Anybody? Any nuance to add to comma? Maybe something you noted in in Little Donker or somewhere else, or if you checked any versions. It links up with the following Kai for both ends. Is that was that in the lexicon? That's was I didn't that's coming from my general Yeah, yeah, that works. That works too. Um you both know me and you know where I am from. Yeah, that's good. And then here's here's where I was going to go with it. The little donker makes the point that it confirms the previous statement. So here's what Jesus is saying. You do know me, and you know where I am from, which then gives significance to what he will say. That's the NIV translation. Yes, you know me, and you know where I am from. And I put and in um, italics there to, to show the emphasis. They're They're trying to say, well... Uh, go back to verse 27, bear with me. We know him, but we know where he's from, as if that can't work together. And Jesus' point is to say, yes, it, it can work together. You can know me, and you can know where I am from. So he's, he's discrediting this idea that nobody knows where Messiah comes from. But then in the statement that follow, he gives it even greater significance. It's not just about where he's from geographically, but the authority of the one who sent me. Uh, so notice that phrase, op him out to, uh, from, I have not come from uh, myself. BDAG on page 321 notes it when used with the preposition op, uh, him out to can carry the idea of, of my own accord or of my own authority. Now, I haven't come of my own authority. Did, did you even, I think you even said that in your translation? Okay, all right. All right, very good. And that's literal and, and good. And you could gloss it if you wanted to. It's from mine own authority. All right, but the one who sent me, ha pimp sauce, how'd you parse that? Uh, it's a masculine nominative singular heiress activity. In, oh, sorry, active participle. Good job. Used how? Substantive. Yeah, and so therefore, what nominative use? Subject of. Well, I'm getting lost between my translations in one part and the charts in another. Mm hmm. Um, and it's, that's right. That's exactly right. The one who sent me is true. Uh, and then, so, ma there, direct object, the one who sent me 
is true. And then the relative pronoun whom, Han, how do you uh, parse that? That's right. Whom you uh, also know. All right. Very good. Oh, uh, sorry. Thank you. Excuse me. So Jesus cried out while teaching in the temple, and you have un again. This could be another one of those consecutive uses of un. So then, G, not therefore, not a conclusion, but then Jesus cried as in the next step in the narrative. Then Jesus cried out while teaching in the temple and said, "Yes, you know me." And you know where I am from. And here's what he goes on to say about where he's from. That I have not come on my own authority, but the one who sent me, i.e. I have been sent by the Father. He is true. And then this phrase, whom you do not know. So that's what the problem is. The problem isn't that you don't know where I'm from. The problem is you don't know the one who sent me. Questions on uh, verse 28. Good? 